On the 4th of July, 1821, John Quincy Adams delivered one of the most remarkable speeches in U.S. history. The speech has gone down by the, in history by the title, In Search of Monsters to Destroy. And in this speech, Adams tells Congress what the foreign policy of the United States is, the founding foreign policy of the country. He says that there's a lot of bad things that happen all over the world. They always have, they, they always will. Uh, he called them monsters. What he was talking about was things like totalitarian dictatorships, um, civil wars, famines, wars between countries, uh, totalitarian dictatorships, oppression, censorship, killing people, torturing people. But he said, this is a country that will not go abroad to slay any of those monsters. That people will just have to work it out for themselves. Except that interestingly enough, he said the United States would serve as a sanctuary for anybody that was able to escape these monstrous conditions. Adams made an interesting observation. He said that if the United States were ever to abandon this foreign policy of non-interventionism, America would become a dictatress. That is a, a dictatorial type of regime that would end up exercising and wielding powers that were inherent to dictatorships. Now, at this time, even if the United States wanted to intervene in other countries around the world to slay these monsters, it lacked the means to do so. Because the size of the military was extremely small. Enough to, to put down some Indian uprisings, uh, win a war against a third world neighboring country like Mexico. But other than that, a very small military force because of the antipathy that our American ancestors had toward what were called standing armies or great big permanent military establishments. It is impossible to overstate how different this country was when it was founded. Now, we, we know the horrific violation of liberty known as slavery. Uh, there were other less egregious violations of liberty like, like tariffs, like land grants to the railroads and all the governmental corruption that came with those. But if we set those aside and we look at things in an overall perspective, it is impossible to overstate how unusual this country was. It was one of a kind. There's never existed a country like this. Imagine when the country's called into existence, no social security, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no welfare to speak of, no income tax. People were free to keep everything they earned and there wasn't anything the government could do about it. No IRS, no drug war, no DEA, no SEC, virtually no economic regulations, certainly no minimum wage laws, no price controls, no Federal Reserve System, no fiat paper money. Gold and silver coins were the official money of the United States and the American people. No immigration controls. It is the most unusual society that has ever existed in the history of man. This is what it meant to be in America. This is what defined our nation. This is why when the French gave us the Statue of Liberty, this is what they were, this is what they had in mind. This unusual, weird, strange society. And no Pentagon, no CIA, no NSA, no FBI, no national police force. It brought into existence almost inadvertently a free market economy. Principles that Adam Smith had written about in his, in his treatise An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations in 1776, the same year as the Declaration of Independence. 
And it brought into existence what we call a constitutionally limited government republic. That is a type of governmental system where the government's powers are extremely limited. Very, very few. And the result of this? The result of an unhampered market economy and a non-interventionist foreign policy and no big permanent military intelligence establishment? The greatest outburst of creative energy that mankind has ever seen. Despite whatever they teach us in public schools about the Industrial Revolution, the standard of living of the American people from 1800 to 1900 skyrocketed. Tens of thousands of penniless immigrants were flooding American shores to get in on this. Because people were going from rags to riches in one generation, two generations, three generations. And they were doing it by savings because they were keeping everything they earned. I mean, imagine if you could keep everything you earned and you had no income taxes to pay at all, how much you could save. And that savings was going into productive capital, which was making people more productive, which was then causing wage rates, real wage rates, not inflationary wage rates, to rise decade after decade after decade. Americans had discovered the key to ending poverty. And that was through the massive accumulation of capital that was making people more productive. This goes on for a century with sound money. Gold and silver coins is the official money of the American people. And then all of a sudden, the late 1800s, things start to shift. Showing you the power of ideas, for better or for worse. That all of a sudden, socialist ideas began being imported from the socialists in Germany, primarily. This is where social security originated. Among the socialists of Germany, national health care, public government schooling systems, and the idea of empire. The big turning point for foreign policy comes in 1898 in the Spanish-American War. The United States, there were people saying, look, okay, we've become a great nation. We've gone from continent, you know, from, from one ocean to the other ocean. But the real greatness of a nation lies in acquiring colonies and acquisitions and controlling regimes around the world. They looked at the British Empire. They looked at the Spanish Empire, the French Empire, and they said, this is the key to a nation's greatness, even though these empires, especially the Spanish Empire, was crumbling precisely because it was an empire with its out-of-control spending and debt and inflation and debauchery of the currency to sustain these, these ever-increasing operations. So the U.S. intervenes in this war for independence on the part of the Cubans, the Filipinos, the Puerto Ricans, and they, they lead them into believing that they're going to help them secure their independence. And it was a lie. Because as soon as they got their independence, the U.S. said, guess what? We are now stepping in the shoes of the Spanish Empire. We now control you. And the, Span the, the Cubans were shocked. I mean, this is not what they had fought for. But yet, U.S. troops went into Cuba and stayed in Cuba. That's how we ended up with Guantanamo Bay. That's how we ended up controlling this obsessive control over Cuba that exists even to this day on the part of the U.S. government. In the Philippines, the Filipinos resisted violently. They said, no, we fought for our independence against Spain, and we will fight for our independence against you. And the U.S. ended up killing hundreds of thousands of Filipinos and establishing control over the Philippines. So we get Guam, Puerto Rico, because this, the imperialists were saying, is the key to America's greatness. And then comes the philosophy of interventionism that's percolating in the early part of the 1900s. It culminates in interventionism into World War I. Okay, so here you have this, this monster, you know, war in Europe. Europe had been besieged by war throughout the centuries. But President Wilson says, we are going to end all wars. This intervention is going to bring an end to war generally. This is the war to end all wars. That was the motto. Or, or to make the, the world safe for democracy, even though democracy is not even in the Constitution, even though the, the framers and our ancestors got the Bill of Rights enacted to protect us from democracy. But this is what this, this war was going to be about. A total shift in what had gone on before, 
in our foreign policy of non-interventionism. So the U.S. intervenes, total defeat of Germany because of U.S. interventionism, and all it does is it lays the groundwork for the rise of Adolf, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis through the Treaty of Versailles, through, through the con economic conditions that existed in Germany as a result of this massive defeat. So World War II comes along, and we've all been taught, well, we, we defeated Hitler, right? We defeated Hitler. Great victory, right? Well, not according to the polls. And, and remember that the reason Great Britain had declared war on Germany in the first place was to free the Poles from Nazi tyranny. But at the end of the war, and all through the next 45 years, the Poles didn't consider it a victory. Why? Because they ended up for the next 45 years under communist control, under the control of our partner and ally, Stalin and the communists. And our, who arguably were as bad, if not worse, than the Nazis. China ends up under communist control. But here's the kicker. Americans are told as soon as the war is over that there is now a new official enemy. And that new official enemy is America's World War II partner and ally, the entity to whom they had turned over Eastern Europe at Yalta and Tehran, the conferences during World War II, the Soviet Union. That now we're told, even before we even catch our breath and celebrate this great victory in World War II, we're told, you can't stop. And mo most fundamentally occurs the most revolutionary transformation in a government, perhaps in history. Because what happens is that the U.S. government is transformed, converted from a constitutionally limited government republic to what we know today as a national security state. Now, what is a national security state? Well, North Korea is a national security state. China is a national security state. Russia is a national security state. Burma is a national security state. Egypt is a national security state. The United States, post-World War II, became a national security state. In a national security state, everything revolves around the concept of national security. National security is everything. It defines your, your existence. It defines the role of the government. It, de it defines the powers of the government. It's everything. National security is everything. And in a national security state, the government wields massive powers. You've got a massive military establishment, permanent military establishment, totally unlike anything the country had ever seen. I mean, Eisenhower points this out. And, and right before he leaves office, Eisenhower gives his farewell address, right when Kennedy's coming in. And he talks about the military industrial complex. And he points out, this is a new way of life for America. And it was a new way of life. Americans didn't recognize it. A lot of Americans didn't recognize it as a new way of life. They thought it was just a continuum from the time the, 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 the nation got established all the way through today. Eisenhower recognized, no, it's a different way of life. And he, as Eisenhower pointed out, he, well, he pointed out exactly what the framers had pointed out, what our founding fathers had pointed out, standing military establishments are a bane to liberty. That, 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 that the military industrial complex, as he called it, is a threat to our democratic processes. It's a threat to our freedoms. If you don't believe that, talk to people in Egypt. Talk to people in North Korea. And they will tell you what a national security state can do to the freedom and prosperity and peace of a nation. Now, keep in mind that you can be a national security state without having a foreign policy of empire and interventionism. I mean, North Korea is a classic example. Massive military establishment, surveillance over the citizenry, closely monitoring the citizenry, omnipotent powers, powers of assassination. We, we see the North Korean leader assassinating brothers or cousins or nephews, uncles or whatever, anywhere in the world, because a national security state has the power of assassination. Uh, but it doesn't go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. But... Here, we have a national security state that has combined with the concept of interventionism and empire. We see this almost right away with the Korean War, which was always just a civil war. It still is just a civil war. 
It's no more business of the United States than our civil war here is the business of Korea. But they told us, oh, if they don't intervene without the constitutionally required congressional declaration of war, the Reds will come and get us. They'll take over the IRS and the government and we'll live under communism forever. And so they intervene and, I don't know, 40, 50,000 American men you know, dead. And, and the antipathy, a lot of people don't realize why the North Korean people hate the U.S. government so bad. The massive carpet bombing that took place during that war to kill everybody because they were all Reds. They were all communists. And then you've got, in 53, you've got a regime change operation because this is another core aspect of interventionism. Not just empire by acquiring Cuba or the Philippines or Puerto Rico, but by putting your people in office locally and controlling them. And so we destroy, our government destroys uh, Iran's democratic system by ousting the, the democratically elected prime minister who had been uh, Time Magazine's man of the year, Mohammad Mossadegh. They oust him in a coup. They install this brutal dictator, the Shah of Iran. And they, they train his secret police force. That becomes a national security state. They model it after the United States, a national security state. They have a secret police force called the SAVAK. It's a combination CIA, FBI. They train them in the art of torture. And so the Iranian people are living under this brutal U.S.-trained dictator for 25 years until they finally revolt in 79 and unfortunately are not successful in reinstituting their democratic system. So they end up with a dictatorship that's arguably as bad as the U.S. installed dictatorship of the Shah of Iran. But that's the root of the antipathy that the Iranian people have toward the United States or specifically to the U.S. government. The Iranian people really love Americans. They just don't like the American government. And then in 54, the very next year, there's an intervention in, in Guatemala ousting from power and, and planning his assassination of the democratically elected president of Guatemala, Cobo Arbenz. And they install, a, not surprisingly, because a national security state in Guatemala headed by a military general. Because there's always this propensity to favor military generals. They establish order and stability like, like exists in, in Egypt. It's no surprise that the U.S. is supporting Egypt. It's a national security state modeled after the one here where generals are running the show and the, and the intelligence apparatus is running the show. They love that. So they destroy Guatemala's system. They throw it into a civil war, not surprisingly, because people's democratic choice has been ousted. So the civil war, like, like in Syria, it, it lasted, a lot of people don't realize this, lasted a decade, killed about a million people. Okay, then, then the, you've got the interventionism against Cuba. They told us, oh, Cuba's a dagger at the, at the neck of America. We can't survive without a, with a communist regime there. Cuba never attacked the United States or ever initiated any violence against the United States. It was always the other way around. An invasion, the Bay of Pigs, assassination attempts, partnerships with the mafia, and all with the intent to reinstall a U.S. dictator in Cuba, like the one that had preceded Castro, uh, Fulgencio Batista, who, by the way, partnered with the mafia to run those casinos, knowing that the mafia was push selling uh, heroin and using Cuba as a way station for heroin into the United States. Oh, and by the way, Batista's forces were capturing young girls, kidnapping young girls, minor girls in the countryside, bringing them into Havana so that they could serve as sexual perks for the, for the big wheelers in the, in, the, in the casinos as a perk for coming in and, and being in uh, gambling in the mafia's casinos. This is what the Cuban people rebelled against, and this is what the U.S. was trying to install the entire time, reinstall. And then you've got in 73, the regime change operation against in Chile, where again, democratically elected president, uh, Salvador Allende, they go in there, they, they kidnap and assassinate the, the uh, commanding general of the Chilean armed forces, a man named Rene Schneider, totally innocent man. His, his crime, the reason why they kidnapped and killed him, uh, the CIA, it was a CIA plot, was because he was saying, I will not go for a, a coup because it's unconstitutional. In our country, we decide things by election. Allende is won, the military will stand down. That's why they kidnapped and killed him and removed him from the scene, paving the way for a U.S. coup that installs this brutal dictator, 
uh, uh, Augusto Pinochet, who proceeds to round up t about 60,000 people, innocent people, people whose crime was believing in socialism or communism, proceeds to rape, kill, uh, execute thousands of them, and they, they live under this system for the next 20 some odd years. Okay, so this, this is the, all the Cold War. You see, the whole idea of, oh, the Reds are coming to get us. Oh, my gosh, the communists are coming. We, 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 Martin Luther King's a communist, and the FBI's got to start, you know, studying his habits and, and blackmailing him and, try, and hoping that he commits suicide. And the civil rights movement's a communist movement, and there's communists in Hollywood, and there's communists in the Army, and there's this obsession that the national security state brought on for the American people all justifying these interventions. And, and, and then, there, then there's Vietnam, where 58,000 of my generation is sacrificed for nothing. They said, oh, the dominoes are going to fall and the Reds are coming to America. Well, <laughs> South Vietnam fell, and I didn't see any dominoes falling. And then suddenly, in 1989, everything comes... Oh, by the way, not surprisingly, budgets are increasing for this massive military establishment, the CIA, the NSA, budgets every year skyrocketing, putting Americans more and more into debt, and always with the notion that it's just, we have to fight this Cold War, we just don't have a choice. And then suddenly in 1989, it's over. I mean, there was no treaty ending the Cold War, there were no negotiations. The Soviets just said, we're done. No more. And so they withdraw from East Germany. The Berlin Wall falls. They withdraw from Eastern Europe. They dismantle the Soviet Union. It's done. Now, the natural question arises. If, given that the federal government was converted from a republic to a national security state to fight the Cold War, and they said it was necessary to do this, in other words, it's necessary to adopt di a dictatorial type of governmental system, that is a system that is inherent to dictatorships to fight dictatorship. Once the Cold War is over, the natural question arises. Why don't we get our republic back? What do we need this national security establishment for? But the national security establishment was so deeply ingrained now in our governmental structure that they weren't about to let go. Despite the fact that their justification had evaporated. And so then we get this, this period of more interventionism, the Persian Gulf intervention, to, to, to affect a regime change operation um, against a former partner and ally, because this was part of the system, not only regime change, but supporting dictatorships that were favorable to the US government. Partnerships with brutal dictatorial regimes. And, but they turn on them sometimes, you know, like, like, you know, Assad, Syria, we're all taught about how bad Assad is, we forget that the CIA kidnaps a guy, a Canadian citizen, at Dulles Airport, Mehar Arar, and is convinced he's a terrorist, even though he's saying he's innocent. They rendition him to Syria. Now, this is post 9-11. We don't know how that deal got struck. They still won't tell us how it got struck. But how do you strike a deal with a dictator that you're saying is a new Hitler? But you see, they turned on Assad later on after they had partnered with him for a torture of, of Arar, who turned out, as it, as it turns out, was totally innocent. He was tortured for one year and then released. So they, they turn on Saddam Hussein. They intervene. They expect him to be thrown out of office by people, and, but he stays in there. And so there's these complaints. Why didn't Bush go all the way to Baghdad? Why didn't they get, get rid of Saddam and put a, another pro-U.S. dictator in? Well, so that's what the sanctions were all about. For 10 years, interventionism com consisting of sanctions, much like the embargo against Cuba that exists to this day, despite the fact that both Castro's are out of office and despite the fact that Cold War ended 25 years ago. So you got these sanctions that are killing children. Tens of thousands of children throughout the 90s. Three high UN officials resigned in protest of the, what they called genocide. And then there's that infamous statement by, by Madeleine Albright, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. I mean, she's the official spokesman for the, for the, for, for the United States. She announces publicly, tells 60 Minutes, that the deaths of half a million Iraqi children are worth it. Those are her words, worth it. And it, by it, she meant 
worth regime change. Reg trying to get rid of Saddam. Imagine killing innocent children as a way to affect a political end. And the, the temperature in the Middle East was boiling, not just among like these three high UN officials that said, we want no part of this anymore. We have to resign out of conscience because there was nothing they could do to stop it. The U.S. was too powerful. And so, but the, the, the temperature's boiling in the Middle East over what's happening. You have the inevitable blowback. You have the terrorist attack in 93 on the World Trade Center. You have the terrorist attack on, on the USS Cole. In Yemen, by the way, that, the attack didn't take place over here in the Gulf of Mexico. It took place way over there where an imperial warship uh, of the United States was, was visiting. Uh, attacks on the U.S. embassies in East Africa. And every time the terrorists would say, it's because of what you're doing with interventionism. Stop killing these children. Stop stationing your infidel troops in, near Mecca and Medina, the holiest lands of the Muslim religion. Stop supporting the, 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 the Israeli state with foreign aid, money, and weaponry, and so forth. And then, of course, the ultimate blowback comes with 9-11. And immediately, what did they say? Oh, it has nothing to do with interventionism. It's just these people just hate us for our freedom and values. And so what do they do? They double down. They say, okay, the sanctions have not achieved what we wanted to achieve. The deaths of all the Iraqi children has not achieved regime change. So now we got our excuse. Americans are scared to death. So we conjure up this WMD deal and we got to invade Iraq because the mushroom clouds are coming. And it, was, it was just like a repeat of the Cold War stuff about the Reds coming to get us. Only this was Saddam Hussein coming to get us with his WMDs. And so they go in there and they affect the regime change and notice what they accomplish with their regime change operation. Massive death and destruction, the rise of ISIS. <laughs> they produced ISIS with their intervention. The massive refugee crisis in, in, in Europe, uh, you know, massive destruction of infrastructure, homes and businesses. And they called it Operation Iraqi Freedom. I mean, like, how free were these people who were being killed and tortured? And, and remember, they never apologized. The, the, the fact was that the Iraqis were never coming to get us. And yet they stayed there. They said it was about WMDs. Well, if it was about WMDs and they weren't lying about that, why'd they stay? Because ordinarily you would think, hey, admit your mistake, apologize, and get the heck out of there. But they stayed continuing to kill people. And the same thing with... With, with Afghanistan, most of the people they've killed in Afghanistan had nothing to do with 9-11. I'd say 99%. And then you've got the, the Libya regime change operation. You've got the Syria regime change operation. So you've got this massive death and destruction. And, oh, by the way, you have the loss of liberty and prosperity here at home. And this is what Adams was talking about. This is what Adams was saying was going to happen, that America would be, the government would become a dictatress. Because now we live under a system. Imagine this. Do you ever think this as a kid when you were growing up, that you would live under a government that has the power to assassinate its own people? I mean, we know North Korea's got that power, but so does the U.S. government, the U.S. national security state. That's what the Anwar al case was all about. And, this, and, and the court said, we're not touching this. If it deals with national security, which nobody's ever been able to define, we're not going to touch it. The CIA, the Pentagon, the NSA are supreme. They decide what national security is all about and what constitutes a threat. And if they need to assassinate Americans, they have that power, even though nobody ever gave them the power through a constitutional amendment. And then you've got the, 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 the CIA power to... to Take people into custody, the Pentagon, Americans into custody, and hold them forever without a trial. All they got to do is say you're a terrorist. That's what the Jose Padilla case was all about. And the courts confirmed it. And you got the power to torture Americans. This is what Adams was talking about. When he said America will become a dictatress, these are the powers they wield. Now, one might say, well, Jacob, they're not exercising the power. You don't see massive roundups like maybe in World War II with Japanese Americans uh, or World War I where you know, people that were opposing the war, that it's only happened to one or two times. But 
that's not the test of a free society. This is what the framers and our American ancestors understood. The test of a free society is whether the government wields the power. Because, you know, in the right circumstances, all I got to do is unsheath the, the sword. But what we understood from the way that the country was established is you don't give government officials these powers. You prohibit these powers. That's what the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth amendments about. You don't kill anyone without a trial, trial by jury, without due process of law. They have succeeded in circumventing those restrictions. That's the loss of liberty. People say, oh, we're losing our liberties. That ship sailed. We lost our liberty. The moment the government acquired the dictatorial power to assassinate, round up, and torture its own people, even if it's not exercising those powers on a widespread basis. Because given the right circumstances, they will do it. Now, okay. if there was no alternative, if there was no solution to all this, we wouldn't be putting this material out on the chairs. We, we would be passing out cyanide capsules. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> the good news is there's a way out of this. And you know, like when you're feeling bad, when you're feeling sick, and you don't know what's wrong, and the doctor can't diagnose, what do you do? You, you, you go back to founding principles. You say, oh, well, maybe I need to work on my diet. I need to work on exercise. You start doing some soul searching, re reflecting to get yourself feeling better again. That's what we need to do as a country. And the way we do it is we go back to founding principles. And we look for the, for the answer there. A constitutionally limited government republic. A foreign policy of non-interventionism. A free market system that gave us the most prosperous and, oh, by the way, the most charitable nation in history. And so there is a way out. Now, notice we're talking about two separate things here. We're talking about foreign interventionism and we're talking about a national security state. They're related, but they're not the same thing. If we tackle one problem, we solve most of the problems, and that's the foreign interventionism part. We bring all the troops home from everywhere. Korea, Europe, World War II's over. Japan, uh, you know, Africa, South America, bring all of them home, like Switzerland. Switzerland doesn't have troops in overseas countries. And oh, by the way, have you noticed there's no terrorist attacks against Swiss? In fact, there's not even any random mass killings like they are here in the United States, which I think is rooted again in this mindless, massive killing machine that the U.S. government has unleashed in other parts of the world. So you bring all the troops home, and suddenly you have no more terrorist blowback, and you, have, you save all the money that's associated with those expenses of empire and interventionism that have brought down countries, that have bankrupted countries. You save all that money. You discharge all the soldiers into the private sector. You don't need them anymore. They're overseas doing things that are not constructive. Discharge them. There's a doubly positive effect. Now, not only are they not living off tax revenues, they're in the private sector producing wealth. And the people who are paying the taxes now get to keep their money. So all that money goes into private productive capital. So that's that. And, and the good news is that the Pew Foundation has done a series of polls in the last few years and has found that 70% of the American people now believe it's time for the U.S. government to mind its own business in world affairs. Let the world work out its problems. That's 70%. I mean, when I told you earlier that we believe in the power of ideas and, the, and, the, and, the, and adherence to principle, we are getting very close to what might be a critical mass that sweeps across society and demands an end to, to foreign interventionism. Now, the other part of the problem is more difficult for people to comprehend. And I'm not suggesting you automatically agree with, any, with what I'm saying about the national security establishment and a constitutional republic. What I'm here to do is to share ideas with you so that you can process and digest them and you make your own decision. But I say that it's, if you want a free society, if you want a peaceful society, a prosperous society, you got to go in this second area too. You got to dismantle this thing. This, we have a unique opportunity in this country. There is no nation state anywhere that has the ability to invade the United States. They just don't, don't have the money. They don't have the interest across the oceans, the transport ship, the troops. I mean, it, it's, it's an insurmountable problem to invade the United States. We have the opportunity to seize 
that opportunity to, to capitalize on it, dismantle this, this entire totalitarian-like apparatus and restore the founding principles that, that the United States was founded on. The principles of a, of a limited government republic with no NSA, no, no uh, CIA, um, no massive permanent military establishment, a constitutionally limited government republic. Can we do this? Look, people in 1776 and 1789 and 1791, they're no different from any of us in this room. You are the new founding fathers. It's necessary to look beyond your everyday circumstances. We all got our problems in life. We know that. You know, life's not, not easy, okay? And, and it's tough sometimes facing every day, the everyday problems of life, children or financial or whatever. But what we have to do is rise above that. The same way they did in 1776 and 1789, we have to rise above it and, and think at a higher level. Say, what can I do to leave this country a better place? How can I restore freedom and prosperity and harmony and peace for myself, especially myself, and, and, but also for those coming after us? And if we do that, if we stand on principle, this idea of non-interventionism and this idea of a constitutional republic can sweep across a country. There's a reason why totalitarian dictatorships won't allow meetings like this because they know how dangerous they are, because ideas can grip a person's mind, they can grip a person's heart, especially the love of liberty, and all of a sudden, they spread across a land by wildfire. But it means standing on principle, even in your own little bailiwick, within your family, within your friends, and then multiply that by people doing that all across the country, and all of a sudden, we change the world. And that's what we have the opportunity to do. I don't think the world can get out of this status morass in which it finds itself. I think it's only the Americans that can lead us out of this thing, lead the world out of this thing. And, and we have that opportunity. If we, if we stick with our principles of liberty, and if we adhere to principles, and we go back to founding principles, I have no doubt that it is us, the American people, that is ultimately going to lead the world to the highest reaches of freedom that mankind has ever seen. Thank you very much.